Urim and Thummim by Paul Karos. The Chinese method of divination may help us understand the Urim and Thummim of the Hebrews, which are so ancient that details of their method are practically forgotten. We notice first that the Urim and Thummim are two sets of symbols forming a contrast similar to that of yin and yang. It is not probable that they were a set of twelve gems representing the twelve tribes of Israel. Secondly, like yin and yang, the two sets must have been a plurality of elements, and not only two symbols, as is sometimes assumed. And thirdly, they served the purpose of divination, for they are referred to in connection with the ephod, which must have had something to do with determining the oracle. The Urim and Thummim are translated in the Septuagint by manifestation and truth, or as it has been rendered in English, light and perfection. I must note here that the vowels in Hebrew were not present, and using a different vowel can drastically change the meaning. It's almost as if not using the vowel left room for maneuver. Mr. Karras continues. It appears that the vowel in the first word is wrong, and we ought to read Orim, which is the plural form of or, light, and might be translated as the shining things. If Thomim is to be derived from the root Thamam, its vocalization ought to be Thamim, not Thomim, and would mean completed things. We cannot doubt that the Urim and Thomim form a contrast, and if the Urim represent light or yang, the Thomim would represent darkness or yin, the former being compared to the rise of the sun, the latter to the consummation of the day. Sometimes the answer of the Urim and Thummim is between two alternatives, as in 1 Samuel. Sometimes a definite reply is given, which would presuppose a more or less complicated system, similar to the answers in the Yi King. In the history of Saul, 1 Samuel. The answer comes out. Behold, he hath hid himself among the stuff. And in the time of judges, the question is asked about the advisability of a raid against the tribe of Benjamin. And the oracle declares, Go up tomorrow, I will deliver them into thine hand. On other occasions, the oracle does not answer at all, and its silence, do ma, is interpreted as due to the wrath of God. The answer received by consulting the Urim and Thummim was regarded as the decision of God. This view seems to have led in later times, when the process of divination was no longer understood. I make another note 
The name Yahweh should not be spoken aloud. Yes, I said it again. But my brother is named Matthew, the name meaning son of Yahweh. So, regardless of me saying it aloud, I've said it many times, under the guise of the English language. The bird is the word. When the process of divination was no longer understood, to the assumption that Yahweh's voice could be heard in the Holy of Holies, a misinterpretation which is plainly recognizable in the story of the High Priest, Elijah, Numbers 7. The Urim and Thummim are frequently mentioned in close connection with the Ephod, which has been subject of much discussion. It is commonly assumed that the word is used in two senses, first as an article of apparel, and secondly as a receptacle for the Urim and Thummim. Unless we can find an interpretation which shows a connection between the two, we can be sure not to have rightly understood the original significance of this mysterious article. The description of the ephod in Exodus, an unquestionably post-exilic passage, is unreconcilable with the appearance, use, or function which this curious object must have possessed according to our historical sources. And the latter alone can be regarded as reliable. L. O. L. After considering all the passages in which the ephod is mentioned, we have to come to the conclusion that it was a pouch worn by the diviner who hung it around his loins. I make another note. The armor of God is truth, which can be translated as protect your loins with truth. I believe this is another misinterpretation. It was a pouch used by the diviner, using the string as a girdle. The original meaning of ephod is girdle, and the verb afad means to put on, to gird. David, a strong believer in the Urim and Thummim, danced before the Lord, girded with an ephod, and we must assume that, according to the primitive fashion, the diviner was otherwise naked. Another note, I believe the original here is the leaf, the precursor to the tablet, which must be the precursor for the ephod, and the tablet of destiny, the breastplate of Marduk, stolen by Zhu, the oracle, but never retrieved. Yet another note, in the other account, Mikal used the Urim and Thummim to deceive the gods of Saul, making them believe he was cursed. But here, he incurred the contempt of his wife Michal, whose piety did not go so far as the king's in worshipping Yahweh in this antiquated manner.
the main significance of the ephod in connection with the Urim and Thummim was to serve as a receptacle for the lots. And so it may very well have become customary to make it of a more costly and enduring material in the form of a vase. This will explain those passages in which the ephod is spoken of as being made of gold and standing on the altar, as where we are informed that the sword of Goliath had been deposited as a trophy wrapped in a mantle behind the ephod. There are other passages in which the ephod seems to be identical with an idol, but if our interpretation be accepted, there is no difficulty in this, for the receptacle of the Urim and Thummim may very well have come to be regarded as an object of worship. It is difficult to say whether the ephod is identical to the Koshen, the breastplate of the high priest, which in later post usage was ornamented with twelve precious stones representing the twelve tribes of Israel. It is sure, however, that the Urim and Thummim cannot be identified with the twelve jewels, and the Hebrew words plainly indicate that they were placed inside as into a pouch or Sumerian man bag. In Leviticus, another note, the levy is the mound, the mound of the oracle, the oracle originally known as it. Lev it ikus. Levi means joiner or attached, joined in harmony. Although it also refers to a mound, the tribe of the mound, the tribe of Levi. It would also be cognate with the demon of the box, Dibuk, meaning cling, adhere to almost as if it is a strap for a girdle. <laughs> In Leviticus, the verb Nathan El, to put into, is used, and not Nathan Al, to put upon. The breastplate of the high priest seems to be the same as what is called in Babylonian history, the tables of judgment, which were also worn on the breast, but the identification does not seem convincing. Although, another note, the Babylonian script was transferred into the Greek Septuagint, along with the terms Urim and Thummim, connected to the Babylonian Bellomancy and the later Rabdomancy, which used arrows for casting lots, in order to gain direction from their god, Bel. Zu stole the crown of Bel, and along with it, the Tablets of Destiny, Zu the voice of the Oracle, now known as Bel, who was given the right to make commandments, and united, aha, Levi, he levied, Leviticus, he united, levied, the Oracle worship, reading the flight of birds, with reading the flashes of the thunder, and the arrow refers to the storm bringer, and Zu, the divine storm bird.
I'm not sure if Mr. Karras was aware of any of that, but I'm sure if he were. To Mr. Karras, it does not seem convincing. We would have to assume that the ephod was first worn around the loins, after the fashion of a loin cloth, and later in a more civilized age, when the priests were dressed in sacerdotal robes. It was suspended from the shoulders and hung upon the breast. After Sol Omen's time, there is no longer any historical record of the use of Urim and Thummim. Solomon the Wise is equal to Solomon the Zoo. There is a good reason he was plagued by demons for the rest of his days and they would be the same oracle demons that built the fucking temple. It seems certain that in the post elixic age, the rabbis knew no more about it than we do today, and regretted the loss of this special evidence of grace. Yeah. Yeah, I believe the truth is in the Urim and Thummim. Truth, light, cognate with Arim, curses. The evidence of grace. Grace, the mirror of sin. The rabbis supposed their high priests must no longer be fit to consult the oracle. And Josephus states, Antiquities, that 200 years before his time, it had ceased. According to common tradition, however, it was never reintroduced into the temple service after the exile, while Josephus identified the Urim and Thummim with the twelve jewels in the breastplate of the high priest. Philo of Alexandria claims that they were pictures exhibited in the embroidery of the breastplate representing the symbols for light and truth. His conception is untenable, meaning weak unsupported, but it is noteworthy because of his view seems to be influenced by his knowledge of the sacerdotal vestments of Egypt. We are told that the high priest, in his capacity as judge, used to wear a breastplate bearing the image of truth or justice. One such shield has been found, upon which were two such figures, recognizable by the emblems on their heads, one with a solar disk as the god Ra, the sun god or light the other with a feather as Ma'at or Truth. It is worth noting that the ostrich 
evolved from the Anzu terror bird. If the Urim and Thummim were not plural, and were not contrasts, and if we did not know too well that they were placed into an ephod, would have much to recommend itself. Perhaps he and the Septuagint were under Egyptian influence. I would say these cultures have been influenced by the Sumerian culture. While we do not believe that the Urim and Thummim were exactly like the Yang and Yin, we are fully convinced that the Chinese method of divination throws some light upon the analogous Hebrew practice and will help us understand the meaning of the terms. If the two systems are historically connected, which is not quite impossible, we must assume that they were differentiated while yet in their most primitive forms. Actually, Mr. Karos, if we follow Urim and Thummim from the breastplate of Babylon through Bellomancy to Rabdomancy, we can see that it happens with a change of empire, or when they move to a new culture, or when they reform culture. It's almost as if they demonize the culture they live in. Then they divide and rewrite the text. The old way is demonized, and the new way is glorified. This is a select group of scribes. No faith or race can be applied to them. They are Gallagher's the foreign helpers. I think it's best I leave you with my Sumerian translation of Urim and Thummim. Urim, the beast storm tablet. Thummim, the arrow's direction to depart, connected to Bellomancy and the worship of Bel Marduk. The fate here would be death. All they need is to be given direction. Reminding me of the Battle of 1066, with the arrow going into the eye of the now English king. All they needed was an indication of the direction to travel. <laughs>